Thanks, thanks for joining us this morning at um, our panel, Privatization, the American Worker and the Role of Government. Um, before I get started, I do just want to um, remind everyone it's time to turn your cell phones off. <laughs> the session is going to be taped, so if you don't want your conversation to be in there, there's plenty of taping of our phone conversations already. Um, <laughs> please do that. Also, there is um, an allotted 15 minutes of networking time at the end of the session, so people will have time to talk with each other and talk with us and all that fun stuff, talk with our glamorous panelists here. Um, so, uh, and just otherwise, I expect a very lively panel, but I hope everyone will be um, engaged yet respectful. So um, this morning's topic is a, a very interesting and timely one. You know, when we think about privatization, we could talk narrowly about buying goods, services, partnerships, kind of getting in the weeds of procurement. But, but I think the really bigger picture question for all of us is, and what's so fascinating about this issue, is it seems like our country is really at a crossroads in thinking about the role of government and what it should be like and what it should do. At the state level, we're seeing massive budget pressures to balance budgets, a wave of conservative um, governors and legislatures that have come in in the last year, a sort of general bubbling of anti-government sentiment Yet at the same time, we're seeing tremendous pressure and a greater need than ever for the core services that government provides. The federal level was seeing much of the same thing. Again, a tremendous pressure to reduce the deficit, and there are some in that conversation who believe the only way to do that is to cut spending and not actually to bring in more revenue. So that creates that dynamic. Um, but there's also been a, a longer-term discussion about inherently governmental functions. We are fighting numerous wars right now. There are many functions that we think of as absolutely core to what our federal government can and should do, like defending our borders, fighting our wars overseas, keeping us safe in various ways here at home. Yet many of those functions are now being done by people outside the government. There are certainly those who are determined to cut government at any cost. They sort of view government as the enemy. It's too large. It's too inefficient. We don't know where our money is going. Yet government isn't just a faceless bureaucracy. It's made up of people and of workers who are charged with carrying out our policies to make things happen, cut our social security checks, solve problems, protect our safety, teach our children, enforce our laws. And I think the American public wants more to happen in many of those arenas, not less. Not to mention there are plenty of people who are sort of disillusioned with the private sector as well. I, I don't know that I've seen any polling on this, but I'm not sure that, um, you know, Often the polls say, well, how do you feel about government workers? And, and sometimes people say, well, they don't work hard enough. But I'm not sure if you polled about government contractors if the numbers would be that much better. But as I was saying, at, at the heart of what we're talking about is um, today is how privatization um, is a lens through which we can see the role of our government and what we want it to do in this day and age. Um, and it's not just, I think, about expanding or contracting, but um, how we view our, our social contracts. So I'm going to, this is our format today, I'm going to introduce each of our pan panelists very briefly. You have their lar longer bios in your materials. And then I'm going to open it up for questions. In the past, we've had sort of panelists do a, a little speech. Each, that's, that's not gonna happen anymore. We're gonna try to keep it lively with some dialogue. We'll have a chance for them to go back and forth for a while first, and then we'll open it to questions from the floor. So to my left is Carrie Corpy. She is the Director of Research and Collective Bargaining Services at AFSCME, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. It's a union of 1.4 million public service workers, and her department provides assistance to AFSCME affiliates around the country on many things, including public sector budgets and finance, um, which should come up quite a bit today. Um, next is Laura Dickinson. She's the Foundation Professor of Law and also the Faculty Director of the Center for Law and Global Affairs at the Arizona State Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law. Her work focuses on human rights, national security, foreign affairs privatization, and empirical approaches to international law. She has a recent book out, Outsourcing War and Peace, which examines a lot of these privatization issues in the context of our military security and foreign aid functions as a country. So look forward to hearing more about that issue. Alice O'Brien is next to her. She's the general counsel at the NEA, the National Education Association 
the nation's largest union representing over 3.2 million teachers, professors, and education support professionals. Before that, she was chief counsel for the California Teachers Association. And at the end, we have James Shirk. He's a senior policy analyst in labor economics at the Heritage Foundation. Um, he's joined, he joined Heritage in 2006, and he has recent writings on joblessness in the recession, uh, federal pay, and unionization um, in the private and, I believe, public sectors as well. So we welcome all of our panelists and look forward to an exciting discussion today. I'm going to ask um, Carrie to, to lead off. And really the question I have, Carrie, is sort of how did we get here? There really seems to be a mindset, um, I don't want to say it's among the general public necessarily, but it's out there in the media, that, um, that public employees are part of the problem. They are a huge uh, contributor to our deficit and problems with our government in general. Um, can you explain, you know, and I think a lot of people maybe don't understand why are some of these functions done by government employees? How did our bureaucracy get so large? That's how they think about it. Can you give us some background? Um, <clears throat> well, our bureaucracy got kind of large, uh, if you would want to say that, because our country grew, um, our demands grew, we um, want, wanted interstate highway systems, we wanted clean air, we wanted clean water, we wanted our children educated, um, and way back in the day, uh, going quite a ways back, when these things were done privately, there were problems with patronage and corruption and bid rigging and kickbacks, and it was decided that the civil service system was a way to protect the taxpayer from those kinds of things. Um, and, and actually, it, it's arguably, when you look at um, the size of our government now, it's not any bigger than it has been historically. Um, we've just grown as a country. so. I want to ask you to follow up a little bit more on that since you represent a very large um, union that uh, represents state and county municipal employees. So a lot of these attacks at the state and local sector affect your employees very directly. Can, can you fill us in and tell people a little bit more about you know, how those attacks, what, what that really means in your view, both for the workers and for government service? Well, um, since the private sector economy tanked in 2008 and took state revenues with it, and as Portia mentioned, uh, demand for public services skyrocketed at the same time. Since then, we've seen a loss of over 500,000 public sector jobs, state and local government jobs. Um, millions of public sector employees have been furloughed. Um, some furloughs amounting to as much as a 10% pay cut. Um, major restructuring of pensions and health care benefits. And when, when you were talking about the image of government, you know, we, we hear about the overpaid, underworked government, government employee. I think that's been going on for decades. I would like to describe to you a little bit our average AFSCME member. It's a female. She's about 48 years old. Um, might work in a library or a public school or a county courthouse. Makes $44,000 a year on average. She contributes 5% a year on average to her pension, and when she retires, collects a pension that averages about $19,000 a year. Um, and about 25% of her members don't have Social Security, so that's their pension in retirement. So I don't really think that's the problem with our society, is that somebody <laughs> retires on $19,000 a year after a lifetime of service contributing to their pension. Um, but that is certainly being how things are being portrayed, and we're seeing a you know huge effort to drag those wages down to eliminate pensions and health insurance. Um, I think I'm going to jump over to Alice because Alice, I think uh, some of the concerns that Carrie just um, raised are very closely aligned with some of the members you represent, and um, and you've also worked with many other types of workers. You know, we think of the things our government should do, and we might think, well, okay, it's okay for government to you know, buy pens and paper. Government shouldn't be making pens and paper. Then there's sort of a spectrum of activities that we think about um, as core to our, our public functions, and we often think of education as a core function of what state and local government should do. Can, can you talk about, but there has been some privatization in that arena. Can you talk about what forms that has taken? And also, I'd like to hear how what's happening in education and teachers is, is you know, reflective or not of what some of Carrie's members are experiencing. Sure, I'll take a crack at it. Um, in terms of the overall 
picture for education, you really, and I think for public sector employees generally, you can't really start the debate until you recognize what happened in 2010, in the November 2010 election. And what happened was this. Um, 20 states became entirely controlled by the Republican Party. Um, and that provided the basis for passing a passing or at least considering a wealth of legislative initiatives, some of which have to do with privatization, but a lot of which just um, increase the push towards sort of free market reforms. And in the education arena, I think privatization is not really a question of taking kids out of public schools because public school enrollment has, has remained fairly constant over the last um, since the turn into the 20th century. It's been um, about 90 percent throughout the throughout that time period, and it hasn't varied very much. Um, but there is now increasingly an idea that we should just take money um, and give it to kids to go to whatever school they would like to go to. You know, we have had vouchers in the public school arena for some time, but this past legislative session is the first session where we really had widespread voucher legislative activity in many, many states, 53 voucher bills introduced. Uh, Mitch Daniels in Indiana was successful in passing a voucher bill that for the first time would provide vouchers for kids in 60%, 60% of the public school population in Indiana will be eligible for school vouchers under the Daniels uh, voucher bill. That really is unprecedented. and It's the largest voucher bill in the country. And I think when implemented, um, really could fundamentally change how we view education and its delivery in the country and whether or not it is an inherently public function or not. So I want to follow that up with a question. I think a lot of folks who favor privatization um, or sort of, as you said, more broadly free market reforms would say, well, the good thing about that is it introduces competition and that makes everyone improve, it improves quality, keeps costs down. What's your response to that in the education arena? Well, in the education arena, the fun, the key question with respect to vouchers is four out of five private schools in the country are religious and are fundamentally religious. They are pervasively sectarian institutions. Uh, their educational mis mission is to educate children um, in the tenets of a religious faith and to propagate the faith. Um, and if our government is paying for education in those schools, there's a, there's a really basic separation of church and state issue under, I believe, under the federal constitution, but the Supreme Court doesn't agree with me on, on that one, but certainly under the state constitutions, all of which have very strong language against the compelled support of religious institutions. Also, I think one of the fundamental tenets of having a public education system is to provide the framework for democracy, a common basis of understanding among citizens. And if uh, you decide that you're going to educate a large portion of the public in schools that believe in very different fundamental precepts than sort of the, the public wheel, I think our society looks quite different as a result. So, um, Alice, you raised a point about the, the politics behind a lot of this privatization. And I have to say, um, looking at a lot of the efforts, there have definitely been privatization efforts under Democratic as well as Republican executives, but there does seem to be a trend, particularly in the current efforts, of um, not just privatization for the sake of making government um, allegedly more efficient or uh, more responsive, but also to um, attack public sector employees and unions in particular. And James, I wonder if you could comment on that, because it really does seem like there's a heavy ideological agenda there. And I know you've done a lot of work in this arena. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I think there's two separate questions. And they're distinct questions, and uh, we should you know, try and keep them separate. One is, what is the appropriate size and role of the government? What do we want the government to do? And then the second question is, once we've decided the government is going to do something, how should we best go about doing that? So I, I imagine there's going to be a, a lot of ideological disagreement, uh, you know, not just you know, on this panel, but in the country over what do we want the government to do. But I think we should all want the government, whatever it is going to do, you know, you know, education, uh, you know, I, you know, some things obviously we all agree it should do, like uh, it's, you know, basic you know, public services. Uh, 
we want those to be as efficient uh, as possible. We've got limited public resources, and if we're spending you know, too much money on, uh, on one sector, uh, that's, that's not just more taxes you know, coming out of the, the taxpayers' wallets, but that's also more money that you can't spend, say, on social services elsewhere, that you can't, say, uh, you spend on providing uh, medical care for, uh, your, for indigent persons. I mean, there's limited you know, uh, budgets within the, the overall public, and we should want to keep things as efficient as possible. And that's the great advantage of the private sector, is that in the private sector, you're held accountable in that you can lose the, the job, you can uh, lose the contract. If you've got a company that's inefficient, that's doing a bad job of providing uh, services, well, the customers go elsewhere, the company goes bankrupt. And that's, it, it can be painful uh, if you're in a company going through that, but socially, it's a great benefit that you don't have companies that are doing a horrible job of providing for the, the customers, uh, you know, continuing to keep doing that. New companies come in, you've got competition. And you don't have that in the public sector. I mean, you're, you're try firing a government employee. It's an incredibly difficult process. What you have is you've got a lot of bureaucracy, you've got a lot of stasis, and so you take uh, you DC public schools, which uh, you've got, uh, I believe the, uh, the literacy rate in eighth grade is that uh, it's less than one third of DC uh, public school eighth graders are functionally literate. Uh, you've got a, an overall a high school graduation rate of about 70%. You know, the, by every measure, the, the DC you know, public school system is, is not doing the job that we would want it to be doing. And what do you do about that? Well. You, with the with vouchers, uh, with the uh, the opportunity scholarship program that they <coughs> passed, you give parents the choice to say, all right, you know, I'm not going to you send my uh, child to this high school, which has been doing a poor job. I'm going to send it to another school. Could be a religious school, could be a non-religious school. I mean, the reason you've got so many religious schools is because you, you've basically got to shell out your own money in order to, you know, to pay for it. You're already paying once for the, you know, the, the public school system. So it's only those people who are, you know, have a very, very, very strong motivation to actually pay that. Uh, and uh, you've got, yeah, obviously, the Catholic Church has subsidized their school system. If you had a broader system of vouchers, you would see far more non-religious schools popping up. But in a system where you've only got public funding for the, uh, the public schools, that doesn't happen. But what happens when you introduce that choice? What happens when you introduce that uh, competition? What we've seen in, uh, here in DC with the, the school voucher program, it's, it, it's very exciting. I'm an economist, unlike uh, most everyone else here, and you know, most of you in the room who are lawyers. Uh, but you know, it, the great challenge for economists is how do you actually measure what is, you know, how do you prove cause and effect? And the gold standard is if you have a randomized trial. You've got some group of people who are randomly, you know, uh, given a treatment and you know, some people who are not. And we had this with the DC scholarship program because more people applied than could go in. And what we found was that the, the high school dropout rate uh, for those who uh, went through the program dropped by two thirds. So for the overall DC public school uh, population, you've got a 70% dropout rate. Uh, sorry, a 70% graduation rate, 30% uh, uh, dropout. For those who uh, went to the voucher schools, uh, it was a 91% graduation rate. That's really exciting. And that's why you've got this, you know, the, this push for these measures. We want the, the most efficient provision of the services possible. Uh, and you just you don't have the competition, you don't have the, the accountability to con the, the consumers and the, re you know, the recipients of the government services. If you've got a, a government monopoly, introduce the private sector, and then you, I mean, it, it's a separate question from, you know, should the government be uh, providing this? We all agree that the government should be funding education. But the question is, how do you receive it? I mean, Jake, can you, yeah, sorry. So, no, I just, I want to follow mm -hmm. up on a point. I, I think the, the particular example you gave may mm -hmm. bear some drilling down on because you have problems with self-selection and other mm -hmm. issues. But, but I want to ask you about this accountability issue and, and, a, and providing um, services in a more efficient way. I, I don't think mm -hmm. anybody disagrees that we want our government to be efficient. We want it to be effective. We probably also want it to be transparent to us so we can know if it's doing the things we want it to do. And, and one of the things that I've observed is in some ways public employees are very easy target, right? Because we know how many there are, we know how much they're paid. Heck, I used to work on the Senate. Unfortunately, you can still find like my practically weekly paycheck um, <laughs> on the internet, which is, it wasn't very big, but uh, it's really not very fun. Um, so, but, but the problem is, I think, that we don't have the same level of transparency on the contractor side. And I, I know people have talked a lot about the growth of uh, federal government, but heck, we've had a lot more growth, actually, on the private contractor side, and we know a lot less about how the dollars are spent. Can you comment on that? And then I want to turn it to Laura, because I know she has some expertise here. Well, the, the accountability comes when you put the contract up for bid, is that you know, if you've got you know, Acme Corporation, you know, say, you're bidding $50 million, and you know, some competitor built, you know, bidding $40 million, well, you can see, all right, you know, their competitor's more efficient, we'll switch the bid, we'll go to, uh, to the other guys who are willing to provide the same service, you know, same specified contract.
uh, for less. And so the, the accountability then you comes either if, if you've got the government you're contracting for the service like that or with the parents. Uh, what you find with the, you know, both charter schools and with the, uh, the DC voucher program is the parents say that they are much, much more satisfied uh, sending their children to these schools than they were with the, their previous options. Uh, so that's, you know, it's, again, you're, you're giving you know, the individuals the choice. Um, and yeah, I, I, I trust individuals to make a far better decision than simply being told, here's where you're going to go. You don't have any choice in the matter. You know, accept the school and you know, trust us to do a good job. Why not introduce the choice? Why not let people make the decisions about the, the best school to, to send uh, their kids to? I have to say, I'm guessing there are some other DC public school parents in this room where choice sometimes makes us tear our hair out. But but, um, but let's put that to the side. I, I want to go to to Laura to see if you have a response to James's points, and also if you can tell us a little bit more about this issue of transparency and accountability. Okay. Well. I'll speak about transparency, but first I, I just want to say that you might think that if there's one area that um, is inherently governmental, it's fighting wars. Um, but it turns out that we have radically changed the degree to which we outsource much of our security functions overseas. Um, we now have close to 200,000 contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan, more contractors than troops, doing everything from cleaning latrines and delivering meals to troops to um, guarding diplomats and bases. And in the past, they've been conducting interrogations. So they don't do offensive combat, but they come pretty close. And um, it's just an enormous shift in how we project our power overseas. And one of the things I look at in my research and in my book in particular is sort of how this how this came to be, and I think it ties in with what others have been saying on the panel, um, because I think a dominant impetus for this is the ideology of privatization, the belief that the private sector can do these jobs better. And that ideology dominates our politics such that it's much easier for the Defense Department, State Department, various agencies to add contract positions performed by private firms than to add governmental positions. Um, now, it may be that in some cases the contractors can do the job better, but uh, we've got a lot of evidence that in many cases they can't. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Commission on Wartime Contracting has said that um, we've lost billions of dollars through the contracting process because of poor oversight and accountability. And the transparency issue is huge, particularly in the foreign affairs area. Um, what contracting does is it, it reduces the political cost of war. It's harder to see what we're doing overseas. The, the, the deaths of contractors are not counted in the same way as troop deaths. And also, um, our transparency laws that apply to the government don't apply to the government contractors. So um, FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, doesn't have the same reach with respect to contractors as it does uh, with respect to government employees. And so a lot of what the contractors are doing is uh, shielded from scrutiny. And so I, I think we need to increase transparency rules with respect to contractors. And I should just note that after hearing after hearing, the Defense Department still can't give a precise tally of the actual number of contractors, um, which is, I think, quite uh, shocking. So I'll stop there. Um, so a question about that, Lauren, maybe you can fill us in. You know, I thought there was some sort of movement by some of the defense agencies to try to bring back in some of the in essential governmental functions to try to actually do, as you're talking about, some kind of inventory so we figure out what's being done by whom, are there, are there jobs that should be brought back into the agencies? Can you tell us a little more about like where does that stand now, especially now in this era of saying, oh, we need to cut deficits. Does that play into this dynamic? Well, I'll just uh, speak with respect to my area. Maybe yeah. others can mm -hmm. speak to the other area. I, I, there is some reevaluation going on, but I, I should just note that I think that trying to bring these functions back into government, um, these, these uh, foreign affairs functions, is a, is a losing battle, I have to say. Um, and so I think that we would be better served um, 
uh, increasing accountability and oversight of the contractors we have, at least in the near term. Um, I know, you know, for example, um, then Senator Clinton co sponsored a bill before she became Secretary of State to eliminate security contractors. Um, as soon as she became Secretary of State, she walked right back from that uh, because she realized she needed contractors to protect her employees. Um, and the reality is, the political reality is, that I think it's going to be easier to get more stringent oversight of these contractors than it is to bring them back in. Now, there have been efforts to increase the number of monitoring and oversight personnel, which is essential. Because if you don't have monitoring and oversight personnel and you've got contractors, you're going to have billions of dollars in waste and abuses. So I think that we need to do that. But in terms of bringing it all back in-house in the foreign affairs area, I don't think that's going to happen. And so when you're talking about more oversight and accountability, you're talking about more thorough audits? What else? Oh, I'm talking about goes. criminal accountability mm -hmm. for contractors. There's a Civilian Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act that's pending that Senator Le Leahy has co-sponsored that would make it more possible to hold contractors criminally responsible when they commit abuses. I'm talking about contract terms that specify uh, more clearly that contractors have to follow the laws of war, I'm talking about better contract oversight, improved transparency rules, a whole range of reforms. Actually, in this area, I think accreditation of the firms is a, uh, an important um, uh, reform, and I think that that may happen. So basically, um, I think we should have report cards for these firms. And if they don't get a certain grade on their report cards, they shouldn't get contracts. Um, I know Alice is going to be burning to respond to some of the points James made earlier, but I'm going to—I I won't forget you. I'm going to carry for a moment. Um, so, so what about this idea of you know we may be facing um, a lot of this privatization and outsourcing? I'm sure we're seeing it at the state and local level. I mean, we, in a lot of our core services programs, TANF, CHIP, um, food stamps, we. We've already gone this way, and lots of states have already gone this way, and it looks like this trend is only going to accelerate in, in an era of, of slashed budgets. What do you think about some of these ideas that Laura has floated in terms of, of accountability? And, and I, I'm going to add another question in there, which is I think you know, there are a lot of nonprofits that work with state government and private public partnerships to say, okay, you can't keep your TANF open, office open at night. We can be a gateway to help people get services. Is that always bad? So that's kind of two questions together. OK, well, <clears throat> on the accountability end, um, Laura mentioned that the federal government can't give you a precise tally of how many uh, contractors are overseas. Mm -hmm. Paul Light, though, did do a study of the federal government that shows that there are four times as many contract employees as civil servants working for the federal government. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you take that figure. There is not one state in the country <clears throat> that can tell you a a tally of how much is contracted out, not one. I defy you to find a state that um, can tell you how much they've contracted, what they're spending, how many workers they've contracted out, and so on. They can tell you precisely what their headcount is of state employees, and by God, they're not going to increase that, right? So um, you, you've got that. You, you do what can be measured, and what can be measured is cutting state employees. And, and meanwhile, the um, you know, what is the thing? The pigs going down the python, or something like that. It, it's uh, the, you're get, the work's getting done, it's just getting done under the table. Um, so that would be one important element of accountability, is to just know how much already is contracted out, what does it cost, how many people are employed, is it saving any money? Um, to go back to James's point um, about competition, and um, as that relates to accountability, um, I think that's sort of a myth Often when a service is privatized, there's less competition. There's a lot of activity, for example, to privatize prisons. There are two companies, GEO and CCA, pretty much, that do prison. Now, how much competition is that? And there may be one company. They may merge in 10 years. Who knows? Libraries, a lot of privatization of libraries. One company, LSSI out of Rockville. Um, you can look, there's some cities have enti entirely privatized. CH2M Hill or some, whatever their name is, there's one company that does that. Lotteries, one or two. So I think competition is a myth. And in terms of accountability, what we see more and more in private contracts is, written into the contracts is the privatization of profit and the socialization of risk. 
So for example, when you look at some of the asset privatizations, some are written as long as 99 years, a road for 99 years. Good God, we were doing horse and buggies 99 years ago. I mean, how can you ever, a government ever commit to something like that? Um, in the Indiana Toll Road, which is privatized for 75 years, the state had to pay the contractor $447,000 because it waived tolls during a flood. So the contractor lost money. So they had to pay the contractor. Virginia is having to reimburse a private road contractor because its carpooling initiative has been so successful that the contractor's not profiting. Denver, a private road contractor, was able to stop the city from improving parallel roads because it was gonna damage its bottom line. So I, I don't know that that's accountability. I think that's building in the socialization of risk and I see more and more of that. It's possible to write contracts, maybe, if you've got enough oversight and smart enough people on the, on the contract monitoring end that you cover every circumstance, but right now, a lot of the folks in government who are writing contracts are being taken for a ride. It's just completely the opposite. So it seems like a big issue in this arena is sort of the, the feedback loop, and I think Laura made a point that you know with stuff going on overseas, a, a lot of us here have no idea, and it's very difficult to get information. Same with contracts that sort of lock people in for periods of time. Um, I think the examples James was giving of sort of um, DC schools and, and voucherization, things like that, I think public schools and, and schooling in, in general may be a little bit different than some of those contexts because at least as parents you have a feedback loop and you have also other democratic means of taking action or being involved. I think the problem with a lot of these other contracts is frankly there's, there's no way for the taxpayer to either know or be involved. But Alice, I'm sure you have um, thoughts about um, some of the points James was making earlier. I do. <laughs> Thank you. I'm shocked. Are you shocked? Um, in terms of DC, I should say I'm looking at Dan because AFT rep actually represents the DC t teachers. So if you want to jump in, you should feel free. I think it would be good if other people jumped in in the room. I know there are a lot of people who know a lot about this. Um, there are a couple things, though, that are worth pointing out right away. The first thing is um, parents definitely do say when they're given the choice about where to go to school, whether it's in within the context of a public school system or given the choice by having a voucher to go to a private school, the fact that you give them a choice is of value to them and, and reflects in terms of their satisfaction with the education received, regardless of actually whether or not on an objective measure that education is better or worse. Um, the U.S. Department of Education and GAO, GAO have done a study of the D.C. voucher program and found that the test scores actually aren't any better in the voucher schools than they are in the public schools in D.C. So the objective majors don't really sort of bear out the parental satisfaction um, criteria, not that the parental satisfaction criteria isn't important, it clearly is, but it's important to, say, to point out there's another side of that story. It's also important that the vast majority of the DC, the majority of the DC City Council, the DC Mayor, civil rights groups in DC all adamantly oppose the expansion of the DC voucher program. So there's a substantial community presence in DC who believes the voucher program actually undermines the public schools and undermines the public education system in the city. And that's an important factor on the other side as well. In terms of charter schools, um, charter schools are public schools. They are not, it's not privatization. <coughs> charter schools are a form of public choice within the existing public school system. A substantial proportion of charter schools, but a minority are now being run by for-profit operators, like 15% though, we're not talking 50%, probably 15%. Um, and those raise very interesting questions about if you have a public school that's now being run by a for-profit operator, what, where does it fall in the framework of laws? Does it fall, is it still considered a public employer for purposes of state public sector bargaining laws, for example, or does it fall under the auspices of the National Labor Relations Act? That's a question that's now pending before the NLRB in a case. Um, is it a public uh, employer for purposes of things like sunshine requirements, Open <coughs> Meetings Act requirements, transparency requirements, all those things that you would look to that Portia was alluding to earlier, um, that you look to to figure out if the public sector is doing its job. Um, and charter school, studies of charter schools, 
on a whole, as a whole, and there have been a lot of them, there are a raft of them, um, charter schools, some are really, really phenomenal educational operations, but a lot are very poor, and on average, they're no better than the public, the traditional public schools. So the, again, the objective measures of how well an educational system are, is doing do not really bear out sort of the notion that the free market um, makes private schools or charter schools where people can choose to go or not to go better inherently than a traditional public school. Um, I also do want to just take issue, and I, and I just have to do this, uh, <laughs> with the notion that you can't fire public sector employees. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Um, this is sort of uh, something that's trumped out all the time, that it's impossible to fire public sector employees more to the point that it's impossible to fire teachers. Um, first, teachers, unlike most public sector employees and unlike virtually all unionized employees, have no just cause protection at all until they have served an extended probationary period. In 37 states, it's three or more years before you're entitled to any just cause protections during that three-year period you can be non-renewed for any reason at the end of the year. So the notion that you can't get rid of people without transaction costs is just wrong. Um, and tenured teachers are fired and are fired successfully by school districts all the time. I'm sorry to report, because that's the job of my, my job and my job in California and the job of many people I work with to defend teachers. Um, and, those, and the, the costs of school districts moving against teachers are not very significant. Um, NEA defends teachers who are accused of misconduct. Um, most of, and we keep statistics on it, and we, def, and we provide the resources for our affiliates to do so throughout the country. Um, approximately 80% of the cases are resolved before they ever go to a hearing, and 90% of the cases are resolved for $10,000 or less that actually proceed to a hearing. So the costs are not significant in any respect and don't really impair um, accountability purposes. I think what does impair accountability, particularly for private sector, employ private sector schools and for, charter, for some charter schools, is there's very little transparency as to their academic product. Um, and it's very hard. You don't know, in many states, you don't know basic things like the demographics of the students, what are the attrition rates, what are the graduation rates, what are the teacher retention rates, what are the test scores. Those are all things that you would really need to know if you were gonna make an objective measure of educational quality between the traditional public school and the charter school. So I, I think one theme that I'm sensing across the panelists, and I think Alice raises a good point, you may get feedback sort of on a daily basis from your child, but sort of your sunk cost, you may not figure that out until that child graduates from high school. It's not like you can go back and do it again. You know, you can't, you can't buy another one. Um, so, uh, but, but I hear, heard a theme here, and James, I wanna hear your response to it. You know, there's that old saying, like what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. So if public employees are, and public agencies are subject to all these, you know, sunshine, like transparency, accountability laws. Shouldn't private contractors be subject to the same? And I'm going to ask that question in a variety of arenas, both with respect to that, you know, the, the accountability issues and the transparency and, and the measures, similar measures, I think Alice was pointing that out. But also now in an era of talking about cuts, there have been those including the Deficit Commission that said, well, look, maybe we need to cut civil service, but we also, that means we also need to cut spending on contractors. And then there are others who also say, um, you know, we have contractors who's, um, where $700,000 of their executive salary is being reimbursed out of taxpayer money. Shouldn't there be caps on how much, not, not how much they can be paid by their company, but how much the taxpayer is going to pay? of their salary. So those are ways in which you could say, you know, because public employees are limited and um, their salaries are transparent, shouldn't we have the same measures on the private contractor side? Well, I'm, uh, I'm in favor of spending less money on both government employees and private contractors. I mean, I, I want a smaller government, and uh, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to see cuts in both. Uh, but that's, that's a separate question from, again, what's the best way to deliver the public services once you've decided how much you're going to spend on them. Uh, and and I, I think there's a fair point you know, raised by the panel. You know, there isn't you know, like a, a magic you know, private sector pixie dust that you just you know, wave it and 
and you know, therefore you get automatic amazing services. I mean, you've got to do the, the privatizations right. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to have your fairly well-defined um, you know, performance measures and accountability measures, uh, at least if you're doing it, if you're contracting through the city agency. It's, it's going to be different if you're doing something like a, a voucher program where you know, you, you presumably the parents are going to do a better job than any city agency of, of deciding where their kids are going to go. But if it, it's being contracted through a central city agency, uh, you, you do have to have accountability measures. Um, if for the scope of that, I mean, you, you don't want to be burdening for, you know, private sector you know, firms with the same degree of uh, administrative burden that FOIA is. But you certainly some basic measures but, of... Why not? Um, well, if because it's, it's excessive bureaucracy in the government, and you, you don't want to import that bureaucracy into the, the private sector. Um, but you know, there, there does need to be enough information out there for the, the taxpayers and the citizens to be able to say, are we getting good value here? I mean, there, it certainly, certainly there needs to be a, a measure of transparency. Uh, I think there's too much bureaucracy and, uh, and such in, in a lot of the government. Uh, but to, uh, to return to a few of the points made there, yes, look, I, what the evaluations show is that vouchers aren't successful at raising test scores. What they're incredibly successful at is raising uh, high school graduation rates and actually getting people through high school. That same evaluation that Dallas was just talking about showed that it cut the high school dropout rate by two-thirds. We had a 91% graduation rate for these very disadvantaged you know, students in Washington, D.C. That is incredible. There are very few jobs uh, that you can get in the private sector, good jobs, if you're a high school dropout. If you actually have your high school degree, that gives you the opportunity to go on and get you know, further education. I mean, it is, you need a high school degree as a gateway to any sort of good job. The Milwaukee School Voucher Program raised the high school graduation rates by 18%. There was a very good reason that the parents were much more satisfied sending their children there. Now, the test scores didn't go up, but the graduation rates went up substantially. And that's, I mean, again, that's, that's what you'd expect. Parents have the choice. You know, like, again, on average, the, the charter schools don't you know, seem to have higher test scores. But if you're sending your kid to a bad charter school, you're not satisfied, you can just send them to a different school, switch them out. Or you hear from, um, you know, from neighboring parents that you know, that school didn't do as well, you don't send your children there. You don't have that option in the public school system. You're just, you've got these schools which are, are failing to educate children, where the teachers who are known to be bad teachers are left on the job. Once they've got tenure, once you're past that three years, and uh, you know, with all respect to Alice, it's simply not the case that it's easy to get rid of a public school teacher. I mean, you talk to Joel Klein, you know, chancellor of, uh, you know, former uh, chancellor of the New York Public Schools, uh, by no means a conservative, you know, very liberal individual, but trying to do right by the, the children uh, in New York. And what was he saying? Well, basically, the unions make it next to impossible for us to fire teachers. That's why you had those rubber rooms for years after years, uh, because it was easier. Uh, or take a look here in D.C., where you had... Um, uh, I believe it was American Federation of Teachers, not you guys. But uh, Michelle Rhee basically said, All right, we've got a budget shortfall, and we're going to see to it that the, um, the layoffs take place on the basis that we're, we're going to fire the poor performers, not on the basis of seniority. And the unions filed a lawsuit and successfully got that policy overturned and forced them to reinstate all the bad teachers that had been identified James, by James, the principals. I, I think, I think there's, uh, there are a number <laughs> of people who would like to participate in this conversation, yes. but I, I don't, first of all, I, I don't want to make this, because this panel isn't just about schools True. and vouchers, it's about, and, and although mm -hmm. teachers are very important, the privatization mm -hmm. effort is going on in a massive way and a, a massive mm -hmm. scale mm -hmm. across our government. So I'm going to ask you to park that. I think okay. that we're going to get some questions from the audience and some comments from the audience about this point. Mm -hmm. I, I want to turn it back, if I might. Um, so I, I just want to be sure, I, I, yeah. I mean, I think you were saying that you're mm -hmm. concerned about some bureaucracy, important, mm -hmm. although I think FOIA is, it's not, that's actually not government created bureaucracy, that's taxpayer created, right? Like taxpayers want an answer. Um, that's why we have FOIA, it's to protect our rights, not to protect government's rights. Um, but I, I want to turn back to this bigger question, because I did mm -hmm. think you, you provided an opening there for people to discuss, well, maybe there are some reforms that need to happen. I want to turn it back to, to Carrie and Laura to have a chance to say, Something about that, and then I'm going to open it to questions. Um, you know, what do you think about that? So, what if what, what if we do some reductions on both sides, Carrie? And I don't think I got an answer to my question before about, non about the nonprofit yes. partnerships. I mean, yeah. maybe there is a role. Maybe sometimes there are some groups that can help extend mm -hmm. government's reach. And isn't that something we should be doing in this era where government needs to do more, but we don't have as much money to do it with? Absolutely, I realized I didn't answer that. And, and you're right about that. Um, and we do work in partnership, our members work in partnership with nonprofits around the country. We, we think that there are some areas where there's a line where that, you know, whether you wanna call it inherently governmental or ought to be done by merit system employees, when you're actually making the decision about who should get benefits, who should get public benefits, um, and 
things like that. But certainly, you know, our members do work in concert with um, nonprofits around the country. And then you were talking about reforms. And to me, whenever there's a conversation about privatization, it really ought to be about reforms. Because privatization, if anything, is a means to theoretically an end of more efficient, more effective government. And it's not by any way, shape, or form the only means, and in my mind, it's the least effective means. Um, there are plenty of examples of employees and employers in the public sector working together, whether it's in education or workers' compensation or other office settings, to improve services, to figure out how can we deliver services better and more efficiently, um, and do what they do so. There's bid to goal experiments, there's um, labor management committees that have basically sat down and tapped the expertise of the folks who are doing the job and used that to do the job better, to decide how to more cheaply buy tar to fill potholes. I mean, really, you know, basic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the kind of reforms we would love to see. How do caps fit into that? Because I think sometimes we run into a situation where we have like numbers, where it's like, got to cut by 10%. It doesn't matter what needs to happen. I, yeah, got to cut by 10%. Um, if How I had a magic wand, mm -hmm. I would wave it and get rid of caps. Mm -hmm. I would start looking at, um, I don't know if I like the terminology, but what Paul Light called in the federal sector the true size of government. You look at you know, the 1.7 million civil service employees combined with the 5.6 million contract employees, and that's the size of government. And that's what you ought to be measuring. And again, as I said earlier, no state or local government does that, that I'm aware of. And I think that would be a much more effective way of looking at things than caps on full-time equivalent employees. I will cut the state workforce by 10%. Well, okay, the work doesn't go away, you're gonna contract that out. So. Laura, do you have any um, I just want to note that when we talk about accountability, I think it's helpful to disaggregate the various types of accountability that we mean. And right now I want to focus on disaggregating accountability in the form of redress when somebody commits a grave wrong versus accountability as oversight and control. And I think that privatization and outsourcing potentially threatens both forms of accountability. Um, we haven't spoken a lot about accountability as redress, but one of the things that happens when you outsource to the private sector um, is that that avenue becomes more limited. If a public sector employee violates the Constitution, um, you can respond with litigation. But because the Supreme Court is construing the state action doctrine very narrowly, if a contractor commits that same violation, in many cases, there is no method of redress for the constitutional violation. So we have to either think differently about the state action doctrine or think about other forms of redress that might involve uh, other kinds of tort claims. Um, or rewriting the contracts in such a way that there could be a contract claim if you have an outsourced service. So I think that's really important. And um, in the foreign affairs area, for example, there are huge jurisdictional gaps for criminal accountability in the form of redress when we outsource because um, contractors who commit violations overseas in some cases can do so with impunity because our statutory framework only clearly covers Department of Defense contractors working overseas. And if their contractors are working for other agencies, our courts do not clearly have jurisdiction to deal with um, abuses, serious abuses committed by those contractors. Um, but then, so, so what are we talking about? Just to make it concrete for people, we're talking about we need to pass CJA. Mm -hmm. So for foreign affairs contractors to close this accountability as redress gap, this serious gap, we need to pass the Civilian Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act that's pending in Congress, which would close that gap and would make it clear that all contractors for any agency who commit serious crimes overseas could be tried in U.S. courts. So that would close that gap. I think. Um, but across all kinds of privatization, there is this gap in accountability. If we look at accountability in the form of redress that we need to examine and su suggest specific responses to in each sector. Now, accountability as oversight has to do with 
supervision and control. And there I think outsourcing can pose serious problems as well. Um, in the foreign affairs sector, I would just go back to the Commission on Wartime Contracting's conclusion that we've lost billions of dollars due to poor contract management and oversight. Partly, we don't have the contract managers in the field to make sure that the money isn't being wasted and stolen. Um, but partly, we need better transparency laws to make sure, we come back to that, to make sure that the public can know what's going on. Um, so I think we need to look at both types of accountability and how privatization puts pressure on both. I, I think this might be, that was very, very helpful because I think we've had a lot of those themes running through this and Laura, thank you for summing those up. I think it might be time to open us to some uh, questions and comments from the floor because I'm expecting a lot of them. <laughs> um, um, I guess I, well, oh gosh. Um, let's start over here. Okay, Neil. No pressure. <laughs> I'm a uh, proud Teach for America alumnus and an equally proud son of a uh, teachers union local vice president. Um, so I have sort of both sides of the argument very much in my ears at all times. Um, <laughs> in my very limited experience in the public schools, uh, it's been my experience that uh, there is a tendency to blame those who have the least ability to make uh, really foundational changes, namely the teachers in classrooms and there's very little in terms of accountability of oversight, as Professor Dickinson talked about, when it comes to levels of management, even just single layer above teachers. Um, and so I'm curious to know if uh, either Professor Dickinson or, or Ms. Corby can talk a little bit about the extent to which you see this problem in other sectors, in other government-provided services, in terms of the blame game that gets played with those who are uh, where the rubber meets the road versus those who are in position to do things like remediate or to uh, train further or to give additional oversight that uh, I see in education is, is such a massive gap because of poor training or incompetence. Thanks. I mean, I'd, I'll let Alice speak to the education sector, but absolutely. Um, I have uh, scratched my head for years over the fact that when a service is poorly run, what happens often is you keep the person in place who's running it poorly and get, get rid of the folks who are on the front line. And to me, if they can't manage their own workers, who they have the right to hire and fire and discipline, how the heck are they gonna manage a contractor's workforce that is one step at least removed? I mean, sometimes that could be subcontracted even further. So absolutely, we see that. So does anyone else wanna to respond to that? I, mean, I, I can yeah, just throw in, I don't disagree with that. I mean, it's it, part of the benefit, again, of privatizing is it's not just you know the lower but the the tower guys. If you've got a bad management team, if they're inefficient, do it poorly, then they're out too. I mean that's I I, I don't disagree. Uh, in many cases, you've got bad managers. Laura, um, just one of the things I did for my book is I interviewed um, uniformed military lawyers embedded on the battlefield, um, and asked them about how they deal with. Um, training of troops in uh, issues regarding the use of force, and I compared that, their role with respect to that, to the contractors. And there is a huge gap. It's probably not surprising to you um, that, uh, but the military invests incredible resources in training troops, pre-deployment, then in the battlefield, down to the brigade level. There are lawyers there working with commanders to help in the context of specific situations, make targeting decisions and decide whether um, uh, the laws of war and uh, the rules of engagement are being followed. So in that particular area, uh, I can say with great confidence that our military is really trying to instantiate those values and there's a lot of supervision and oversight and there's a whole military justice system for troops that stray. It's not perfect, but it works very well. Contractors have nothing comparable. Training, if at all, is online. Uh, they don't have kind of situation-specific scenarios about when to use force, when not to. They don't have advisors in the field helping them decide when the use of force is appropriate. So I think it's a very clear case of the contrast between the government uh, service and the contract service. 
But so then, Laura, what about this point? Well, if they're not doing that, why don't we just get rid of them? Why do well, I think politically it's going to be easier to increase oversight and control of the contractors than it is to um, bring oh, them no, I meant, like, why don't we just switch contractors? I think that's James' argument. Like, if somebody's not doing the job, we just switch to a different competitive Oh, it's, yeah. Well, happen? the military co is very difficult to switch contracts. We, our military very rarely does. Okay. So. Um, I'm going to go around in the back. Gentleman in the seat. Yes. Yes. Uh, certainly. I mean, the, the devil's in the details. Uh, but you know, in principle, I'm not objecting to accountability. I just want to make sure you do a good job, and it's, it's not done in such a way as to strangle the contractors you know, with, with red tape. But in principle, you know, if, people are, you know, if you've got bad actors, if you've got people who, who are you know, engaging in you know, flagrant violations of the law, you, you, there needs to be a system in place to, you know, to prevent that. Um, let's see. I'm going to go um, up right here. Actually, I'll go to this side of the room. Yes. Hi. Um, public opinion of um, public employees, because it seems like that's what causes a lot of the privatization. I work for Social Security, and when I um, switched from state government, federal government, my future father-in-law says, well, I heard on the radio that the federal average federal employee makes $150,000 a year. I wish. But I wish. <laughs> um, and so I've seen in Wisconsin that there has been a big um, campaign to restore the public opinion of public employees. And I'm wondering if that's happening nationwide, because I think it, it had some progress in Wisconsin, and I can see it progressing elsewhere. So I'm wondering if you're aware of any nationwide campaign. I'm going to put that to Carrie, I think, but I think it's not surprising that Wisconsin has come up in, yes, in this context. Yeah, we've been seeing negative opinions about our members. I mean, it's, 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 it's awful. And as you know, working for Social Security, I mean, you're overpaid and lazy and, you know, sorry. <laughs> um, we've been seeing it for years. I, I think what happened um, after the November 2010 elections is that a lot of these governors overreached. Um, and it got to seem so personal and vicious and people realized that you are talking about a librarian here, you are talking about my neighbor, you are talking about a firefighter, a teacher. These are folks who are typically doing a good job. And so, yes, we've seen a tremendous shift in public opinion um, towards supporting public employee collective bargaining, for example, um, two to one, um, as a fundamental right. And um, we've, we've also worked a lot to try to dispel the myth of the overpaid public employee. Um, People often like to quote BLS statistics that show that public employees make more than private sector employees on average. We've done a number of, and, and BLS, BLS says, by the way, don't just compare these. They're, they're not comparable. We've done a number of studies where you compare apples and apples, where you look at the actual composition of the workforce, which in the public sector is more heavily public safety, teachers, college educated workers, and no retail clerks or fast food workers who, God bless them, don't make much money. <laughs> so you, you compare apples and apples, and even including pension and health care benefits, and you find that public employees are typically slightly lower compensated than their private sector counterparts, um, especially at the higher ends. Um, at the lower ends, when you get to custodial and food service work, they tend to be slightly higher compensated. And I'm not going to apologize for a second that somebody makes 12 bucks an hour instead of 11. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's not a problem in my opinion. So if I could uh, just mm -hmm. jump in on that as uh, the author of one of those studies that uh, talk about the overpaid federal workers. Um, now, we did uh, make very clear in the study that, that you know, the sort of, you know, the average federal employee gets 120000 a year is not a fair comparison for exactly the reasons you said. Uh, that you've got a more educated workforce, you know, more experience, you expect them to earn more. Uh, what we found is when you make the appropriate comparisons at the federal level uh, to account for all those things, the premium drops down to 30 to 40 percent, which is a lot less than $100,000 a year, um, or you know, you know, that sort of premium, but is, is still a very real premium. 
Um, now, the, the caveat you have to add there, and I've you know, tried to add my media, is that th this is an average. This is not for every single employee. There are a lot of federal employees, particularly the most talented, who you find uh, are not getting overpaid. And so you don't want to just sort of you know, take a hatchet across the board, but you want to bring you know, the, the pant line. You know, so if the, those guys who are getting underpaid, you do want to raise their pay. Those guys who are getting overpaid, bring it down. At the state and local level, the uh, the problem with the, the studies you mentioned is what they all they look at is basically the money going out the door today. They don't take a look at the value of the promises that are being made. So a lot of these you know, pension funds, uh, you know, teachers are being promised these very generous pension retirements, and the money simply isn't there to pay for it. And so if you take a look at the value of what's being promised, not the value of what's actually going out the door, then you do see a premium. Also I'm going to let Carrie respond level. to that because she's <laughs> <laughs> jumping up out of her seat otherwise. <laughs> Pension funds were essentially fully funded before the economy tanked in 2008. They're starting to creep back up, um, despite the Pew report that came out about a month ago, which was taken a snapshot taken kind of at the bottom of the of the of the uh, economy. You hear about a trillion dollar gap. You cannot talk about a numerator without talking about a denominator that represents about 2% of total state and lo local spending over the next 30 years, which is how long pensions are amortized. People keep on talking about a national problem, and pensions are very local, very local. There's, there's problems in Illinois, there's problems in New Jersey, because those states didn't fund them for years, right? You look at other states, and they're essentially fully funded. And are creeping back up as the economy recovers. So when you say extravagant pensions, I want you to say extravagant $19,000 pension, because that's what we're actually talking about. Oh, here. OK. So I'm glad you brought that up, um, I, what I wanted to address earlier. So that 19000 figure is the, the, the average pension. It's not the average pension for someone who works for 30 years and then retires on that. Like in California, what you get is 2% of your salary multiplied by your years of service. And you retire to what? I believe it's 55 in California. So you're getting, let, let's say you work for 30 years, retire at 55. You're getting 60% of your final salary for the rest of your life you know, from there on forward. Uh, so for a lot of these workers, it's going to be much more than 19,000. It's, it's 20 years, actually. It's, it's 20, 20 years. years. Okay. Oh, it's 20 years? Okay. $19,000 okay. is a 20 year pension on okay. average. I'm going to go to this gentleman in the front here. Well, you know, first of all, you know, this is the ACS anniversary. We're talking about values and America. Since when, and I like everybody, since when is it a bad thing to have pensions? Since when is it a bad thing to, to have teachers that serve the public and so forth? I think I would like you to address kind of a bigger context in which this is taking place which is the attack on unions and the attack on working people. Because, you know, all this stuff here, and I think the professor's research is very, very insightful. What about the waste that has taken place in all this privatization? And isn't there a, a, a loss of a couple hundred thousand that GAL can't find in, in, in the military spending? Stuff? Billions. Billions. <laughs> Billions, I'm sorry. Billions, I And of accountability, how did we get into this financial crisis in the first place? I mean, who was accountable there? There's nobody was watching, you know, I come from New York, the, you know, Wall Street. So I, I just like you to address kind of the larger picture because when we're talking about uh, trying to reclaim values and this whole discussion, we could have an argument about, you know, some of the problems and so forth with delivery of services and so forth. I think there's some contradictions and a lot of uh, sloganeering going on by the, by the right. And I think in terms of progressives, we have to reclaim kind of like what we want America to be. We're not trying to fight for the economy. And since when did teachers become the enemy? So one of the panels, this is kind of more of a comment. I don't know if anyone wants to respond. Um, uh, I'll go here in the front. Can I get the question? Oh, I, 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 thank you very much for those comments. I think you just said it all in this easy response. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, on, the con on the issue of compensation, I have my law firm represents postal workers. Uh, the, the common common understanding among critics of the postal service and critics of federal employees is that postal workers are 30% overpaid. I'm not familiar with the study that Mr. Shirt uh, cited, but the studies that the postal service and postal critics cite uh, are regression analyses that compare demographically similar postal workers to demographic to demographically counterparts in the private sector. They say, aha. On the average, they're 30% overpaid. What they're measuring is race and sex underpayment, gender and race-based underpayment in the private sector, because there is no gap between the white male postal worker's compensation and his demographically similar 
counterparts in the private sector. So it's, these studies really are seriously flawed and they, and they raise very important public policy issues. I, oh, while I have the microphone, <laughs> I also want to comment on the ideological basis. I want to support what was said about the ideological basis for this kind of contracting out. The Postal Service, since its inception as a private, semi-private government uh, enterprise in 1970, has kept postal rates uh, increasing at the rate of CPI. It's kept postal wages increasing at the rate of CPI. In fact, uh, postal rates for large mailers who have taken advantage of work share discounts have gone up less than CPI. So that's a very creditable performance by a public agency. The Postal Service is being pilloried now because it is in debt. It's in debt because Congress in 2006 passed a law that imposed a retiree health benefits funding obligation of $5.5 billion a year on the Postal Service. If, with a, but for that 2006 legislation, the Postal Service would not be in debt. And so, and, and re, the fun, just for those who don't know, the funding of retiree health benefits is unique to the Postal Service. No other federal agency does it. Virtually no private sector company does it. It was an ideologically driven decision to make it possible to privatize the Postal Service by making it fund, pre-fund its retiree health benefits. Okay, I, I'm gonna take moderator's prerogative here since I I think I've done the most benefits work of anybody on this panel. I think that um, <laughs> it's, uh, it is a good point uh, that someone raised about pensions. I mean, it is not a bad thing to have a pension. It is, in fact, it should be a desirable goal of ours to provide pensions that can support people in retirement. And the fact is, if we don't do that, someone's going to have to be, or something is going to be have to, to support those people. Um, and I think with the current economic crisis, we're seeing how a lot of seniors actually are gonna be in, in grave trouble because they will not have a pension, they will not have much equity in their home, and um, the Social Security will, and Medicare will not be enough. Um, okay, can people put their hands up again? Um, I'm going to go to the young lady in the back there. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you very much. Anybody? Who, who, you want to go first, or? Um, well, a, again, in terms of just you know, sort of the mechanics and the expertise, I, mean, I think it would make a lot of sense if you had you know, state agencies whose goal is to basically help uh, you know, help cities and, uh, and localities and counties navigate the privatization process and you know, help them get the best deal possible. Yeah, if you're going in, you haven't done it before, you're not going to have the expertise. So if you had uh, someone in the state government whose goal was to help them you know, so you're not doing it out of the gun. I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. You, you want to facilitate the uh, the best contracts yeah, possible. Uh, but that said, I mean, what you see in a lot of these uh, your contracts is your fairly successful uh, results for the cities themselves. Like, I, I think someone uh, earlier brought up uh, Sandy Hill, Georgia, uh, which was uh, one of these uh, cities. It was a newly incorporated city uh, in the Atlanta suburbs, became its own city, took over operations <laughs> from the county. And what they found is basically they, you know, they're paying about 50 million a year in property taxes for a lot of those you know, services like um, you know, uh, uh, you know, trash collection and uh, you know, cleaning the parks and the like. And their costs when they went to the private company fell in half, and they were able to uh, then turn those you know, savings around. And uh, I mean, for me, I would have you know, cut taxes, but what they did is then <coughs> invested the money in, uh, you know, in building new parks, in, uh, in repairing the infrastructure and the roads, installing new traffic control systems and all their uh, stoplights so that people were spending less time at red lights and saving gas mileage is a substantial improvement in quality for, uh, for the um, 
uh, for the residents of, of this new city that was founded when they privatized pretty much everything besides the, the police and fire services uh, to this company. So even if you've got, I mean, as long as you've got your two companies in the market, you've got a competitive market, and you, both companies are going to have the incentive to, uh, to make the best bid. Um, can I just um, say, I think that using contract the contractual terms as a way to protect certain kinds of public values in an era of privatization is a really important thing, um, important vehicle. And I would just say that in addition to using the contracts, that accreditation, I want to come back to the idea of accreditation of firms who might be receiving the contracts. And um, particularly if you have an independent entity that includes representation from industry, the public sector and the and civil society setting benchmarks of quality and so forth, that accreditation can be a way that can, can help in that uh, contracting process. So I think there's actually a model in the domestic context um, that's useful, and that's um, the National Committee for Quality Assurance, which rates HMOs. Uh, for various measures of quality. And uh, state governments, a lot of state governments around the country won't give, um, won't have their health plan, have HMOs covered in their health plans unless they receive a certain report card from NCQA. Um, and NCQA is relatively independent. It has representation from industry, but uh, other civil society representation as well. I think in the foreign affairs area, that we may get that. There are negotiations underway to do that, to, to bring industry to the table with government actors and civil society to set performance standards, benchmarks, and other measures of quality for the uh, foreign affairs outsourcing uh, process. So I think that accreditation, I would add to, that that is an important way to protect public values when you have privatization. And, and also a way up front, as a back end enforcement yes. can be yes. very expensive and, yes. and time consuming. Um, others ready to speak um, over there? So, uh, I'm uh, president of a component. I'm president of a component of a uh, of federal workforce, uh, the biggest union in the federal workforce is the American Federation of Government Employees. And I have a few comments. Uh, first, as to privatization, it's actually the massive privatization took place before uh, President Obama was elected. For example, in HUD, we used to have 18,000 employees, now we have nine. We've demonstrated that privatization actually costs the federal government considerably more than it saves in, in terms of, the, uh, in, of what the employees can do. Um, we've seen, we, we have, as a union, we have limited, federal union, we have limited uh, rights. We can't really negotiate salary generally and uh, we can't negotiate pension. We've seen that we've been sacrificed consistently. Uh, I mean, that is the Obama administration in terms of the debt ceiling uh, negotiations went to increase our uh, pension contribution by 500%. We've also, you, we've talked about uh, attacks on, on unions. On the viciousness of the attack on, 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 our, 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 on our federal unions is just incredible. I was, two weeks ago I was at a, we're, we are federal employees and we're paid by, we're, these are open shops, we have to represent everybody. And we're paid uh, in a, uh, by the federal government in the form of official time. Uh, the Republicans in the House want to get rid of official time, which would actually get rid entirely of unions. Uh, in terms of allowing people to make choices, you know, we, we, there was a fair election in terms of uh, the Transportation Security Administration employees where about 97% uh, voted for a, a union. There's still a, a runoff as to which of the two unions. Uh, but uh, the Republicans now have introduced legislation to get to get to not allow TSA employees to organize, even though Border Patrol people Sir. are organized, police are organized. Sir, uh, I, I just want to be sure if you have a question for the panelists okay. that we figure out what it well, is. Well, there wasn't, okay, my, my issue was there really wasn't this federal perspective on, the, on in terms of the attack, and what I was actually mm -hmm. trying to provide was a federal perspective. And I, I agree. I actually um, I, I asked the, the panelists um, yesterday. I was like, "Can anyone talk about the federal perspective?" And I completely agree. We have not had the chance to do that, and it's an, an important part. Um, but some of these proposals on the 
the 10 percent cuts, for example. That is talking about the federal workforce, and the Deficit Commission has talked about that, as well as maybe cutting on the contractor. And I think Laura did allude to a lot of, I mean, your, your perspective is the federal. It's just not the broad federal well, perspective. I, I, Any comments from the panelists on that comment? Um, or? Well, I actually testified on that hearing on official time. Um, but uh, I, I mean, a, a, again, it's, uh, does anyone think that you know, unionizing the Transportation Security Agency is going to make it run more efficiently? I mean, if the if the goal is to provide the, the best quality yes. public services, <laughs> okay. That well, that's not where, I mean, the push for it's coming from, uh, from the union, not from, uh, you know, from your security officials saying, man, this is a way to, uh, you know, to improve the TSA's you know, okay. uh, efficiency. I, I do want to try to get in one or two more questions. So um, folks who haven't had a chance to raise their hands, maybe I'll go back to the side of the room. Oh, Anne. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, there's um, the Swiss initiative, um, a kind of an initiative initiated by the Swiss government and the International Committee for the Red Cross, and the United States has been very involved, and the British government and a number of other governments have been involved in setting, um, bringing industry and civil society and the governments together to, to set standards for contracting. Um, it's still under discussion, and I think that the labor issues are important. And just to take my area of expertise, the foreign affairs contracting, 80% of the contractors uh, overseas are not US citizens. So we have huge issues regarding um, various kind of labor training, all sorts of issues there. Um, so, I mean, that's definitely an area that needs to be worked on. Um, there are all sorts of reports of abuse, people's passports being taken away and being forced to work in difficult situations. Um, uh, there are people who refuse to work, and then in a security situation, what are you going to do? I mean, so there, this is a huge issue that needs to be on the table in discussing the accreditation. Um, I, I actually want to know if Carrie has any response to that too, because I think the question is um, not just accreditation, but like you know, if, if we're talking about um, trying to provide decent um, right. wage standards and other benefits that um, we think all workers should have, is there something to be done to scrutinize how contractors are are doing and being sure they're following the law and, and in fact providing decent jobs? Well, some cities have established living wage ordinances saying that anybody who's paid by a grant or a contract has to provide a living wage defined in that local ordinance. Um, there are some places where procurement law um, or regs would say that um, that define a, a level of savings in order to contract out. You have to save 5%, 10%, whatever it, is, whatever it is. And the savings can't be taken out of wages and benefits. That basically the wages and benefits should be a level playing field. Any savings should be true efficiencies, not just you know exploiting the workforce. So yeah, there are efforts to do that. Um, the gentleman in the yellow shirt. Back there. Good afternoon. Uh, real quick for the question, I have a question for you guys. Uh, I just wanted to say that like uh, labor lawyers uh, on union side should 
members happy buyer as a compliment, because that means that we're, um, we look unstoppable. <laughs> <laughs> My question for the panel is, as far as privatization, uh, and you know, a lot of stats are thrown out, like, well, why are schools are allegedly failing, and why the government can't do certain services, and that's, you know, that's going from one side. And then suddenly the uh, logical answer apparently is, let's just privatize, because the private sector can fix it. But I, I'm missing, it's like a missing piece, like, well, what is the problem that's gonna be solved by privatization? And I'm, I'm kind of wondering uh, from the panel, like, what can we do to, a, what, what are some sources of problems that we can try to go after that don't involve privatization? Like how can the government, how can we in, in the public sector work on something that can avoid privatization while fixing the problems that people tend to just assume that's why the government's not working? You want to start on that, Karen? Yeah. I, could, I could start on that. I guess when I think about that, I think about it by sector. Um, so for example, when you look at privatizing roads or sewer systems or water, the problem is that rates haven't gone up. Now, you can either have a, an elected official raise your rates or you can have a private company raise your rates. But, but in order to invest in these systems, rates or tolls have to increase. And they do once they're privatized. Um, and that step is one removed from the electorate. Um, other sources of problems, I'm not sure if I'm getting at your question, but when we look at um, prison privatization, it started booming in the 1980s when three strikes you're out, mandatory minimum sentencing, you know, life means life type laws started getting passed in states and the prison population exploded. And suddenly there's an industry built up to, you know, we can help you with that. Um, and so ways to get around that, I think, is to address sentencing laws. Uh, take a look at that kind of stuff. Um, so there are ways, I, I think in, in many places, we've created demand and because of the anti-tax mania, have not, decided not to pay for it. And, you know, that's, I think that's it, the case in prisons and in roads and infrastructure and so on. So I don't know if I'm getting at your question about ways to deal with some serious issues without privatization. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, the gentleman in the jacket. I, I just wanted to follow up on that point. Uh, Here's how you know that there's another problem. Whenever they talk about privatizing schools, charters, or vouchers, they always cite urban school districts. They never cite Montgomery County, Maryland, where nobody's pushing for charters. They never cite Fairfax, Virginia, where those schools are doing incredibly well. But what's the difference? You have high unemployment in Washington, D.C. You have an incredibly high, almost 50% of the African American male population in D.C. Uh, is illiterate, functionally illiterate. Um, and you have poverty. And so whenever they're talking about, you know, chartering or privatizing or vouchers for schools, they always point to urban districts. So there must be another problem other than bad teachers. <laughs> so those are other issues that we need to address. Uh, um, okay, I realize I've been a very remiss moderator not asking people to wait for the microphone. I guess it's a little too late. Okay, I, we, we do have time for, for one more. Um, actually, I'm gonna ask to go to the young lady standing right next to you, or sitting right next to you. Hi, so I, it, it seems like in the background of a lot of these questions and a lot of the answers are not just an anti-tax mania, but an anti-union mania. So public, or sorry, private sector unionization has been on the decline for a long time while private sector union actually was, was growing somewhat. But something I found, I teach at the University of Illinois, and students, to a surprising degree, are anti-union. They really don't see uh, what unions, uh, what, what public service uh, or, or functions they serve. And I, I was wondering if any of the panelists had a suggestion uh, of how to sort of explain uh, the role of unions and sort of where they play into the privatization debate in a way that is accessible um, to the next generation who I think feels no link to union at all. Um, to James, do you want to go first? And then um, well, I'll, 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 <laughs> I, I saw you want to respond. You might yeah, not have I, an answer. You probably right? want to respond to what I'm going to say. But uh, I'd say you take a look at uh, things like, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen uh, the documentary Wedding for Superman about uh, the attempts to reform the, the DC public schools. 
But who was it uh, who was you know, one of the driving forces to take down Mayor Fenty, who by any measure was a progressive hero? I mean, he signed the, the same-sex marriage legislation here. But he was trying to reform the public schools with Michelle Rhee heavily backing her. And so it was, I believe it was uh, your union, the American Federation of Teachers, that spent about a million dollars on uh, his opponent's campaign. And as a result, a lot of the, the school reform measures that Michelle Rhee I, I am going to ask you to try to respond to her question and <laughs> but, give the other but panelists But it, it's stuff like that. It's that you're very transparently, you're self-interested, but not in the common good. Like, who are the one of the driving forces opposing the sentencing reform laws? The prison guard unions. Well, why is that? Okay. I mean, in California, they fought the attempts to weaken three strikes throughout. Okay. Fought, yeah. So I, I take it from that. You, you feel there's a lot of merit to that position, I which do. this this young woman has articulated. Some of her students feel. Can I ask some of the panelists? And this is going to be our last round. So if you would respond, and we can wrap up. Well, um, go, go ahead, ahead Carrie. <laughs> just, just in terms of connecting, uh, I think the union fights of today to things that people might find relevant. Um, our union was. A, Dr. Martin Luther King was killed in Memphis, coming down to support our union sanitation workers who were striking with signs that said, I am a man. And walking down the streets of Memphis with the National Guard with bayonets, bayonets, you know, pointed at them. Um, he came down to support them. The day after he spoke, his speech, uh, I, I may not make it with you, he was killed. And 33 years later, we're having this same fight about whether or not public workers are men or women, whether they have dignity and can sit as equals with their employers. Alice? Alice? Well, I think that's a really nice note to end on. The attack on collective bargaining is really a, an attack on democracy at its base. Um, and it's an effort to silence public sector unions um, and put them out of the democratic process. I think the right wing has been very explicit on that point in a lot of places. Um, and the important thing from my perspective is that the public sector unions, the public sector associations are not going away. They have been reinvigorated, re-energized by what has happened this past fall. You see it in Wisconsin. Um, and I think you tell your students, certainly from the perspective of public education employees, public education employees have been associated for over a century. They have been the major force in this country behind the growth of public education, the availability of public education for everyone. Um, and we will continue to be so. On that note, I want everyone to give a big round of applause to our panelists.